Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. We welcome Steven Pinker and Neil Ferguson back to Live Talks Los Angeles. Videos of their earlier appearances at Live Talks Los Angeles are in our YouTube channel. In this episode, they'll discuss Pinker's book, Rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce, why it matters. I'll let Neil introduce Steven. Neil Ferguson is a historian and the author of 16 books, most recently, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, for which he appeared at Live Talks Los Angeles. He is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. They will talk, and towards the end, I will pose some of the questions sent in from you in the audience. Take it from here, Neil. It's my great pleasure and honor to uh, be uh, introducing my old friend and former colleague, Steve Pinker. He's the Johnson Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard. Uh, and he has an amazing academic resume, really. Uh, he has a, a range of interests that go, goes far beyond the standard uh, academic silo. He's worked on a whole bunch of academic experimental psychology stuff, including dental imagery and visual attention and even children's language development, which most of us become amateur experts on at some stage in our lives. He's best known, I think, for the books he's written for general audiences, The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, Words and Rules, The Blank Slate, The Stuff of Thought, The Sense of Style. It's a, an extraordinary, impress, impressive list. The last two books, The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now, took him into territory more familiar to me because this was Steve, the social scientist, using a whole mass of data to help us understand ways in which life uh, has got better uh, over the centuries. And uh, you and I, Steve, used to have animated debates when you were writing those books about trends in in violence. Uh, historians are, aren't quite as bad as journalists when it comes to looking on the, the dark side of life, but they, they're close. And, and I think I was always pushing back saying, surely it's, it's a more dangerous world or it's a nastier world than you think. Anyway, we're not here to talk about those books. We're here to talk about uh, Steve's newest book, Rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce, why it matters. And Steve, I want to congratulate you on the book uh, because, and this is not just uh, me being a good friend and a and a nice guy. It's actually a, a fantastic introduction to all the different mental pitfalls uh, that we can fall into. And by explaining what they are, uh, I think you do help the reader to become just a little bit more rational. In fact, I found myself thinking as I was reading the book, you know, everyone, every undergraduate should read this because a typical problem that we all encounter as, as teachers is that undergraduates typically don't have a great grasp of, of probability. Actually, come to think of it, a lot of professors should read this book because many professors don't have that good a grasp of probability. Anyway, I want to, I want to begin this conversation with a quote that you, you used in the book from one of my favorite Tom Stoppard plays, uh, Jumpers, and I'll just quote the the original lines. The National Gallery is a monument to irrationality. Every concert hall is a monument to irrationality. And so is a nicely kept garden or a lover's favor or, or a home for stray dogs. You stupid woman, you deleted that, but it's in the <laughs> original play. If rationality were the criterion for things being allowed to exist, 
the world would be one gigantic field of soya beans. Well, clearly, Steve, you don't mean rationality in the sense of we should just plant soya beans, but maybe it would be a good place to start just to ask you what you do mean yeah. by rationality. It's an excellent place to start because one of the, uh, the, the, the impediments that I faced in writing a book that tries to explain and extol rationality is that people do uh, contrast it with a kind of you know, dour joylessness, a utilitarianism in the sense of maximizing you know, calories or GDP. But rationality is always in pursuit of a goal. There's no such thing as rationality, or at least we wouldn't call it rationality if someone just said true things, because most of those things would be, might be true, but would be useless. Rationality is a way of attaining something, whether the, what you're attaining is some goal in life or objective truth or deep explanation, but it's a, a, a set of tools that deploy knowledge to pursue some goal. Now, there's nothing wrong with that goal being beauty and love and, and, and meaning, uh, but once you have set yourself that goal, the question is, what can you do to get it? Is rationality at some fundamental level math and the ability to do math? You give one of my favorite examples, which is a smartphone and a case cost $110 in total. The phone costs $100 more than the case. How much does the case cost? And everybody listening should just figure it out. Let's just give uh, listeners a moment. I'll say it again. Get your pencil out if it helps. A smartphone and a case cost $110 in total. The phone costs $100 more than the case. How much does the case cost? Now, if you think the answer is $10, you're in good company, but you're wrong because the real answer, as Steve shows, is, is $5. Uh, and we won't go through the, the, the mechanics of explaining why it's $5. The interesting thing is just that intuitively one gets the wrong answer. So I wonder how much rationality requires a sort of ability to do to do math without which you're really going to be adrift. Well, it's, it's a great example. It comes from a three item test called the cognitive reflection test de devised by Shane Frederick, um, precisely because it doesn't really require much in the, in, in the way of fancy math. I mean, it's, it's subtraction, you know, uh, a dollar. It, it, sorry, if the smartphone costs $100 and the case costs $10, well, then the smartphone costs $90 more than the case, not, not $100. Now, you don't, that's not calculus, it's not analysis. So it's a test not so much about mathematical proficiency, but about overriding your first impulse, thinking twice and uh, avoiding the quick but wrong answer. So mathematical uh, ability helps, and it's correlated with ability to avoid common fallacies and illusions and biases, but it's by no means the same thing. And a lot of it is, are you willing to just step back and think, well, wait a sec, let me avoid the snap judgment, the quick answer, and, and think it through a, a second. One reason I liked the book was that I got three out of three on the test. <laughs> but I, I had to think. And in fact, I was slightly appalled at how slowly I arrived at, at the right answers. There's another component, and you give us a sort of uh, a, a, a structure, because the next layer of rationality is logic, isn't it? And, and, and the ability to think logically. I mean, I don't know how best to illustrate this, so maybe I'll just throw, throw the, the ball at you. If you wanted to give an illustration of what logical thinking is like and, and why it too doesn't come completely naturally and instinctively. Maybe you could you could give us one. Sure. Now, logic is not the same thing as rationality. And in fact, in, in the book, I explain why sometimes it can be very irrational to, to follow the laws of logic. Uh, logic is simply, what are the necessary implications from uh, a, a statement or set of statements? The prototypical example is, let's say, all women are mortal, Xanthippe is a woman, therefore Xanthippe is mortal. That's uh, pretty close to the textbook case with a little gender substitution there from uh, the cliched Socrates. But, uh, and if you give people logical problems, they will often come up with surprisingly um, <clears throat> uh, incorrect answers. I mean, the classic example is, um, imagine you've got car cards where there's a letter on one side, a number on the other. 
uh, and you're testing the rule, if there's a D on one side, then there's a three on the other. You give people four cards, <clears throat> a D, a three, an F, and a seven. That is each of the possibilities. What's the smallest number you need to turn over to test the rule if D then three? Most people turn over the D, most people turn over the three. <clears throat> the correct answer is you have to turn over the D and you turn over the seven. Well, again, at first glance, that seems, that, that seems wrong. Uh, but then when you think about it, of course you have to turn over the D and everyone gets that right. But you really don't have to turn over the three because the rule says if D then three, not if three then D. It's an example of the classic fallacy of, of um, uh, denying the consequent. You do have to turn over the seven. And again, when you think about it, this is not, uh, you know, as they say, rocket science. It's not, not uh, Aristotle. If the rule says if D then three, then if you turned over the seven card and there was a D on the other side, well, that falsifies the rule. Uh, and almost everyone agrees when, as soon as it's explained to them. What's going on? Well, a simple ex explanation, almost correct, uh, is that we are all victims of confirmation bias. That is, we seek out evidence that confirms our beliefs. We're not so good at figuring out which evidence would disconfirm it. And so it's an example of a failure of logical thinking that could have widespread ramifications. I mean, uh, it's a little bit uh, of a stretch, but the fact that we all tend to read the magazines that have op-eds that confirm what we already believed, the fact that we, it's kind of annoying to have to read something that disconfirms an idea that you held, you know, could, could be tied to it. Now, I mentioned that logic is not the same as rationality. The reason is that when you do logic, you have to forget everything you know and concentrate only on what is stated in the premises. And that can lead to responses that are in the larger scheme of things, not so rational. Here's, here's an example. If I ask people, if people are asked to verify the validity of the following syllogism, where validity simply means does the conclusion follow from the premises? All things made from plants are healthy. Tobacco is made from plants, therefore tobacco is healthy. Now that is a valid deduction. But if you ask people, can you uh, tell me whether that follows the laws of logic or not? Does the conclusion follow from the premises? Most people say it does not. That is, they get the answer wrong from a logician's point of view, because they can't help thinking, what are you talking about, tobacco healthy? They can't <clears throat> segregate their knowledge of the world from what is actually stated on the page. In the same way that when you take geometry in, in high school and you're asked to prove that the, uh, the, the, the two sides of a triangle with two equal angles are, are equal, if you pull out a ruler and you measure the sides, you don't get any credit, even though in real life, it's a sensible thing to do. So logic means, <clears throat> zeroing in simply on what's stated in, in, the, in the premises and forgetting everything you know. And it's one of the crucial answers to the question, are people rational? By a lot of these standard tests, like the if D then three test, no. On the other hand, there's a kind of broader ecological rationality that people tend to fold together their uh, sense of logic with uh, their, their common sense, everything they know about the world. And that's why we're, we tend to be better than, than, than robots, than AI systems, because we know so much. But it does mean that we will flub tests of logic where the goal is to keep outside of the problem anything that isn't stated in the problem. Well, the, the script writers for Star Trek had great fun with this because Mr. Spock was the, uh, the Vulcan who who was logical and uh, and therefore thought differently about most problems from from Captain Kirk, but but Kirk was the captain, and and I think you're kind of telling us why Spock was not the captain. <laughs> uh, I wondered as I was thinking about that whether rationality, as you think of it, is is something evolved in Homo sapiens, uh, it, it evolved uh, in, in the sense that it's actually a, a, a benefit to our, our survival if we have the kind of rationality you're talking about. Mr. Spock was from a different planet and therefore he came from a different evolutionary source. Is that the right way to think of rationality in this book as a kind of evolved set of ways of thinking or, or is that the wrong way to think about it? I think it is right when it is put in the, in, in the context of the difference between the world in which we evolved and the world that we live in now. So yes, and I begin the book with a discussion of the San of the Kalahari Desert, hunter-gatherers who have uh, 
uh, practice the, their, their, their lifestyle for hundreds of thousands of years and offer at least a glimpse into the world in which we evolved. And they're, they're highly cerebral. They, they interpret the tracks of animals, um, the fragmentary evidence there and infer what animal left the track, what was its um, gender, what, was it, what's, what is its condition, is it likely to be tired, in which case they could pursue it to exhaustion and bash it over the head when it kills over from heat stroke, or is it spry and young and not worth pursuing? They, and they engage in critical thinking. They learn not to trust their first impressions. They, uh, if a respected elder has a hypothesis about what animal it is and a young upstart disagrees, the young upstart can, can, uh, can criticism, criticize him. They engage in probabilistic reasoning. So if a track could have been left from either of two animals, but one of them is more common in that uh, neighborhood, they'll go with the more common animal, what we call Bayesian reasoning, and, and on and on. So, uh, and this is to resist a, a common narrative to say, well, why are people, why do people believe weird things? Why do they believe you know, conspiracy theories and quack cures? Well, what do you expect from hunter gatherers? We evolved to uh, you know, chuck spears at, at, at uh, antelope in the savannah. Uh, that's why we're so, uh, so, so um, uh, crazy. And I, I resist that step because we are the species that lives by its wits, that was not confined to one ecosystem like the savannah, but took over the world. We live in, in jungles and in the Arctic and, and in deserts. And it's because of our know-how, our, 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 uh, our sapience. The difference is that since we have uh, developed tool, better tools of reasoning through the, through the course of history, probability and logic and uh, how to tell correlation from causation. Since we try to apply our reasoning to big questions like how to run a society, those, that itself wasn't what we evolved intelligence for. It was more for the here and now. And it's in extending it to any old abstract question that you really need to acquire the formal tools of rationality that don't come naturally to us. One thing that struck me, Steve, as I was reading the book, was that it doesn't have much about violence in it. And, uh, and that, that made me think back to our earlier conversations about war and other forms of violence. So here's a, here's a kind of fairly obvious question. Uh, how do, does one explain the fact that throughout history, millions of men, nearly all, always men, have, have laid down their lives in, in war. Was that all irrational? Or is there some kind of rationale for, for violence that can be put into this book, which I felt needed a, a chapter to tease out uh, the, the, the rationale, if indeed there is one for violence? Or do you classify violence as actually irrationality, some kind of uh, some kind of uh, aberrant behavior. I mean, I, I was thinking this because between reading your book, I was also reading uh, with my nine-year-old son, Thomas, uh, The Eagle of the Ninth, a wonderful story about the Romans in Britain. And there's a moment in early in the book when uh, the, the centurion, who's the central protagonist, hurls himself uh, at an oncoming a chariot uh, uh, driven by a rebellious Briton with a very high probability of, of, of dying to try to break the, the Britain's charge and save his men uh, and let them get back into the fortification. So how does that act of, of self-sacrifice uh, fit into your, your definition of rationality? Yeah, it's a, a profound question and it, uh, <clears throat> Uh, it, it pertains to the chapter in the book on game theory, which which can uh, uh, help us understand situations in which what is what might be rational for an individual may not be so rational for lots of individuals when everyone does it at the same time. So let's let's put aside the coalitional case of, of dying for your battalion or your your country or for a cause, and just deal with simple predatory violence like. You know, a brigand who who, who uh, beats and robs a, a passerby to steal what they have. Well, there's a kind of res rel relative to the goal of getting stuff. It can be rational to take it from someone else. The problem is that when everyone 
uh, engages in that kind of rationality, everyone is worse off because then you get the Hobbesian war of all against all. The, uh, and it's a familiar situation in game theory, sometimes called the, the prisoner's dilemma, the tragedy of the commons. In The Better Angels of Our Nature, I just adapted it and called it the pacifist dilemma, that we really would be better off if we all uh, agreed to divide things up, to allocate them according to effort and, and, and uh, merit and, and investment, uh, rather than exploiting one another. And um, because even though it's to my advantage to enslave you or to rob you, it's to your advantage to enslave me or rob me. And we're both better off if we decide to uh, refrain from those and, and just cooperate. The problem is that unless we both come to that realization and put it into practice simultaneously, the te temptation always exists for one to exploit the other. And I consider it to be almost a, a quasi technological solution that if you can change the incentives uh, from uh, conquest, exploitation, predation to cooperation, that's how you extricate yourself from the dilemma. I mean, this is a, you know, an old idea. It's the social contract. It's the Leviathan. If we all agree, okay, I forego my right to exploit you. If you forego your right to exploit me, and we've got a third party that enforces it, then it's um, to my advantage to, to cooperate, to abide by the law if I'm going to get uh, punished. If we have a regime of trade and exchange, then it might be cheaper for me to buy stuff than to steal it. Uh, all of them, uh, things like governance and, and commerce being uh, kind of accomplishments of modernity. And the, I try to explain the uh, historical declines of violence when they exist as workarounds, as gadgets, as innovations that extricate us from this game theoretic dilemma where it's to the individual's advantage to, uh, uh, to exploit, but to the group's advantage if people refrain from exploiting, how do you get from one to the other? Now, when it comes to uh, the soldier who dies for his country or his platoon mates, there's another game theoretic uh, element there. And I talk about that a little bit in, in how the mind works. And you know, part of it is that on it, it can be evolutionarily advantageous to take a gamble that could result in your own death if the net payoff is uh, works to your advantage. Uh, this relates actually to the chapter in, in rationality on, on uh, rational choice and expected utility because evolution works on averages, on expected utility. And I think it's not a coincidence that in battlefield strategy, you don't have so many uh, kind of suicide uh, uh, commandos, people who know that they're going to be the one who is mowed down. Generally, the I think a lot of military strategy, and you would know this a lot better than I would, tends to at least create the illusion that everyone has an equal chance of being killed. So you might be killed, but you're not uh, the one who is sent out into battle with the certainty of being killed. You're taking your chances, and so are your platoon mates. This is re reminiscent of... Uh... The story I tell in, in Doom about the song, the bells of hell go tingling-a-ling for you, but not for me, uh, that the soldiers, the, or perhaps the young man's assumption that that the, the odds of, of death somehow don't apply uh, to to oneself, but maybe to the guy next, next to you. But well, exactly. Me... And I, I tell a story in How the Mind Works that I read from Anatole Rappaport, the game theorist. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I don't think it's apocryphal, but it's a great story. In World War II, someone did the calculation that so many planes were being shot down in sorties over Japan uh, that it would actually be there would be fewer uh, airmen who would die if you had lighter planes with less fuel. Uh, therefore, they were more nimble. They could get to their, their mission without getting shot down. However, they would be one-way missions. They'd be suicide missions. And so many planes were shot down that actually, if everyone would agree to this scheme, let's say you would draw straws, and the pilot with a short straw would be the, the suicide bomber, the kamikaze, uh, your overall chance of dying would be less. But no one went with the plan because <laughs> no one wanted to be the guy who knew he was flying off to his doom, even though the odds of surviving uh, a, a, a sortie without drawing st straws was lower. But the psychology tends to militate against kamikaze, suicide uh, bombing, and other um, uh, certain deaths.
Of course, we call it kamikaze because the Japanese did adopt that strategy in the later stages of the war. And that, that brings me to a, a question about, about culture uh, and, and indeed about, about religion. Uh, I, I was looking for Richard Dawkins in the book, wondering if the selfish gene would make an appearance. And I was reflecting on your and, and Richard's thoughts on, on religion over the years. Uh, I wonder if in the framework of this book, religion is just irrationality, or whether there is some uh, role that it plays, perhaps some evolutionary benefit that it confers that would explain why for most of history, human beings have been religious. How do you think about that, the sort of notion of, of an afterlife, for example, which is a feature of so many uh, religions? Is it just a quirk, a kind of irrationality that, that is leading people to make bad decisions in, in this life? Or is there some place for religion in your, in your schema of rationality? Well, I'd want to unbundle the different components of religion. <clears throat> and and you know, several hundred years ago, religion was just uh, you know, government culture. It was just woven into all aspects of, of, uh, of human culture. Uh, and it's probably since the Enlightenment that we have started to unbundle them, say for ha having non-theocratic governments, for example. But so let's start with just the the, the belief component that tends to be associated with religion, that is belief in supernatural entities like gods and souls and, and miracles. And I, I think there is a feature of our psychology that makes us vulnerable to that, and that is our intuitive dualism. The fact that we all conceive of one another as having minds and bodies. You know, we don't deal with each other as as, as, as machines, as hunks of flesh, as robots, as wind-up dolls, but we try to get in each other's heads and we just assume there's, there's someone home, there's someone in there that is conscious, that has beliefs, that has desires. Uh, today, a scientifically sophisticated person knows that this is, consists of the firing and neural networks in the brain, but that's a pretty recent uh, epiphany. The, the natural way of thinking about it through most of our evolutionary and for that matter, cultural history is that people have bodies that house minds. Well, from there, it's a short step to imagine that the minds can persist independently of bodies. And in fact, there's even some uh, kind of empirical evidence that that's possible, like dreams. Some part of you is up and about in the world and your body's in bed the whole time. Or sudden death, a person's walking around, they have a heart attack and all of a sudden something that was animating at a moment before seems to have parted company with it. Now, now we have explanations in terms of you know, oxygen getting to the, the, the brain and complex neural networks firing in patterns, but that's a, a recent and unintuitive revelation. It's much more natural to think that minds and bodies temporarily coexist. So you have that whole set of beliefs that go into to, uh, religion. Uh, you mentioned uh, Rit, our, our friend Richard Dawkins, and he does make an appearance in the, in the book in terms of why we, um, given that it's natural to believe in um, souls separate from bodies, it's also, uh, I should add, another intuition that probably served us well through most of our history, but that science now disabuses us of, is the intuitions of design, of teleology. We know that our creations were done with Kind of, you know, forethought that we, we designed them. And it's a short step to think, well, the, the, the universe was designed by someone or something, that everything happens for a reason, that there are no coincidences, all of which are false, but which are cognitively natural. Now, we unlearn these intuitions when we get a, a good education, when we, we become numerate and, and scientifically literate and historically literate, uh, but it's easy to fall back on them. Now, fine. So let me uh, uh, wrap this up so we can uh, uh, continue this dialogue. Uh, you know, I noted that when Richard Dawkins and the other uh, new atheists like Christopher Hitchens published their manifestos that there's no good reason to believe in God, that it's irrational to believe in God, they were hit by a storm of denunciation, not just by Bible thumping evangelists, but by fellow intellectuals. And it wasn't that they said, yes, here's all the evidence that God exists, but rather it's kind of, kind of uncouth or, or just not done to consider God's existence a matter of truth or falsity. And that was, is one of the major themes of rationality, that we tend to partition our beliefs into those that we agree are 
objectively true or false, testable, evidence is rele relevant to them, like uh, how do you keep a job? How do you keep the kids clothed and fed and off to school on time? How do you keep a roof over your head? There, you know, people are, are pretty rational most of the time. But then when it comes to more distant cosmic questions, what's the origin of the universe? Why do bad things happen to good people? What's the ultimate cause of disease? What goes on in palaces and corporate boardrooms and, 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 and uh, quarters of power that I will never set foot in? There, the intuition is you can't find out most of our history, we couldn't. And so mythology, uplifting stories, uh, entertaining um, myths and, and tales are uh, uh, the, the best we can do. And what's important is not showing that they're true or false, but whether they are, they are morally edifying and, uh, and entertaining. One of the things that, that I was left wondering was whether uh, a society of, of rational people would, would be uh, a stable society. After all, experiments with religion-free societies didn't go brilliantly well in the 20th century. Uh, have you kind of run the thought experiment of a society in which everybody read your book and arrived at a higher level of rationality, uh, cast uh, religion and superstition aside? Would it work as a society, do you think? Uh, are there any downside risks to our being fully rational? Well, if we recall that rationality has to be deployed in service of a goal, and that goal is human well-being, then uh, you probably can't be too rational. But and and um, uh, w once we agree on those goals, that's what I called humanism, and it was the fourth term in the subtitle of Enlightenment. Now, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Third term. I'm sorry, uh, because it is it is a value. It is, and this gets back to Stoppard. Is there anything in rationality per se that says that you've got to prefer uh, uh, puppies and gardens to, 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 to soya beans. Uh, and there isn't, but once we agree on certain goals, values like life and health and knowledge and well-being, then rationality is what, what pursues them. Now, speaking of, of religious or, or, or not so religious societies, of course, the Soviet Union was uh, famously atheistic, and it was a, uh, you know, and as we know, all, all know, it was a hell, uh, because it, the, it was um, uh, in the thrall of a particular ideology that was resistant to um, rational discussion in the sense that if you criticize it, you would be sent to the gulag uh, or, or get a, a shot in the back of the head. And once you disable the mechanisms of collective rationality, uh, then you can easily get locked into various kinds of uh, horrors or, or craziness. And again, actually just throw out that it's a major theme of rationality, that the game theoretic problem that we talked about earlier, namely what one person pursues in their self-interest can result in a situation that's uh, worse for everyone is true of rationality as well, in the sense that any one of us pursuing uh, uh, what we think of as rationality won't give us rationality unless we have a, uh, an arena, a community, um, an institution where there are certain norms that'll, that um, winnow out our inevitable irrationalities. Things like open criticism, freedom of the press, uh, peer review, fact checking, editing, where we can each check each other's irrationalities. But those who talked most about reason in the French Revolution uh, were also those who, who were most enthusiastic about uh, the the use of uh, the guillotine. And, and, and though the Soviet Union didn't use reason and rationality quite so much it, it would still conventionally be argued by marxists in the 20th century that it it, it was a rational system and that marx uh, had had observed capitalism and 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 rationally come up with a critique so there's all, always a sense i think that that people who profess uh, to to being in in pursuit of reason may turn out not to be or made directors into some dystopia this is gk chesterton's line the, the problem with atheism is not that men believe in nothing it's that they'll believe in anything uh, so i wanted to to kind of turn from from this historical problem that collective rationality uh is is a is a difficult thing to pull off uh, and ask a, a a more focused question 
uh, I, I'm going to quote you here uh, before I ask it. And this is almost the sort of su summary of a large part of the book here. We discount the future myopically. We try to recoup sunk costs. We assess danger by availability. We misunderstand regression to the mean. Our blind spot for exponential growth makes us save too little. Our difficulty with Bayesian thinking can terrify us into overinterpreting a positive test for an uncommon disease. And as I was reading these, I was thinking, how, how much am I learning from your book that I don't already know from Danny Kahneman's? What's what's different about your approach mm. uh, compared with the sort of behavioral economists like Kahneman and Tversky, whom you you quote and acknowledge? I'm I'm just looking for the 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 additional knowledge that I didn't already have from them. Yeah, a few things. Let me let me go back to the first part of your question. The, um, you know, one, of the, one of the principles of rationality is that someone who claims to be rational isn't necessarily. Uh, and indeed, it is by, you know, and the, the, the Soviet Union was, was not rational. I mean, you know, it collapsed, it resulted in enormous amounts of, of, of human uh, misery and, and, and waste. Uh, the French Revolution, I'm not sure whether Robespierre extolled rationality. It, could be that um, again. This is something that you that you could. It was one of those who did. I and mean, the cult of reason was an attempt to create a substitute for Christianity. And uh, well, uh, and those most most enthusiastic about it were also great proponents of the terror. And this has always made me nervous. Of, of well, the, yes, but the solution is nervous <clears throat> of the word safety because of the Committee of Public Safety. Yes, but it, it is it, it is rationality that allows you to argue this was a mistake. Something went horribly wrong. And the fact that they claim to be uh, um, advancing reason doesn't necessarily mean that they were. In fact, in this case, we know that they weren't. And how do we know? Because we're applying rationality. And rationality can always uh, <clears throat> pop up a level, look on applications of itself, and um, spot the flaws in what we may have thought was rational, but in fact uh, was not. And uh, even though there are have been some people in history who claim to be rational, and in retrospect, we realize how wrong they were. Certainly, the ones who who uh, blew off rationality did not have a better track record. It's not as if you pit rationality and irrationality and irrationality leads to better societies, including, by the way, ones that are highly uh, secular, as virtually all Western societies are in uh, practice. If you compare theocracies and liberal democracies with some a real separation of church and state. You know, I think the, uh, the the secular liberal democracies are much better places to live. Now, some of them, of course, like like England, have a nominal uh, are nominal theocracies, but in practice, to what extent do the the priests, the mullahs, the ministers dictate policy as opposed to have some symbolic role? You know, I, I think we can safely say that they're they're uh, pretty secular. Now, but the Chesterton quote leaves out a crucial concept. And it is, I think, a mistake to say that if uh, one shouldn't believe in uh, an invisible deity, an invisible creator, an invisible enforcer, therefore the only alternative is uh, atheism, which could very well be amorality. There is an alternative, it's humanism, namely that there is something that you can believe in, namely that the ultimate moral value is the well-being of sentient beings their health, their happiness, their, their knowledge, their, their uh, quality of experience. That is something to believe in. Uh, it's not, may not, well, I, I would argue that it probably is rational, but whether or not it is, it is a goal that, that, uh, that many people would agree on. Now back to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing, uh, yes. So my, uh, my sort of follow-up question was, yeah, okay. uh, how does the, the, the new book add yes. to the, the whole body of literature we now have on uh, cognitive biases that, Kahneman and Tversky yes. uh, and others have have have, have written. I, I'm kind of asking myself what I'm what I'm, I'm on behalf of, of potential readers. What do I get from rationality that I don't already know from Danny Kahneman? Yes, well, and and there's no question that I have an enormous debt to Danny Kahneman and my my late colleague at Stanford, Amos Tversky. Uh, they really were um, you know, pathbreaking and um, brilliant brilliant researchers. Uh, so a, a, a few things. One of them is they. Uh, their proposals have met some resistance within the community of cognitive psychology for, in some cases, selling our species short, that there are ways in which people can be uh, more uh, <clears throat> made more rational if problems are presented to them in more mind-friendly ways, that some of their 
um, demonstrations of human fallacies involve you know, somewhat trick questions. Um, but uh, also their, their inventory of fallacies and biases, uh, representativeness and availability and some cost fallacy and so on, uh, often don't explain the features of irrationality that are most captivate us today, like you know, QAnon, like you know, chemtrails, like 9-11 truthers. Uh, and I wanted, uh, I set my, as one of the goals in this book to try to explain the flagrant irrationality around us. And, and there, you know, the gambler's fallacy is of not much uh, help in explaining QAnon. Um, I also, um, more so than, than Amos and, and Danny, um, leaned into some of the philosophical literature on what is rationality, why should we be rational, on logic and critical thinking. And I ended with uh, a, 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 something of an argument that may be flattering it to call it an argument, but at least the plausible case that uh, rationality is a morally positive force in human life, that it has led to some of the great movements for social change and, uh, and moral improvement. I want to come back to that, but before we get there, let's talk a bit about the conspiracy theory phenomenon, because my my reading of that old Chesterton quote, which, by the way, is 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 actually not not quite what Chesterton said, though it's close enough, is just that he's saying in a secularized world where we've moved away uh, from Christianity, we're susceptible to to pseudo religions. And my way of explaining QAnon or uh, the parallel cult of wokeism, the, the, these contemporary movements that are at least uh, to our eyes, profoundly irrational, is that they're kind of ersatz religions that have filled the gap that was previously occupied by a tried and tested religion. And I wonder if that's how you think about them. T tell us a bit about yeah. some of these conspiracy theories. They, they, they kind of exist on both sides of both ends of the political spectrum. Uh, how do you think about those? And, and how do you explain the fact that really large proportions of people, not only Americans, it's true around the world, subscribe to extraordinary beliefs? Example, half of the people who've declined the vaccine for COVID say it's because the vaccine would be used to implant a microchip in their, in their bloodstream. How, where does that stuff come from? Yeah. Uh, we seem to be a long way from rationality if, if that many people can believe that crazy a theory. Uh, and, and indeed we are. Uh, <clears throat> several things. So, so absolutely, conspiracy theories and um, wokeism on, on the left do tap into a lot of the same mindset that you see in, in the more fundamentalist and extreme religions. So I think they are, psychologically, it is quite similar. That's a separate question from whether, and, and this relates to the Chesterton quote, <clears throat> whether there's a constant need for religion so that if you kind of squeeze one end of the balloon, it'll pop out in the other, that if you don't believe Christianity, you'll believe uh, you know, wokeism. Uh, that, that might be true, but an alternative is that it's just a, a constant vulnerability, that there will be entrepreneurs that will exploit that those psychological weaknesses in us, but it's not that we have a need for it, but we have a need for, for food or sex, that one could imagine societies that aren't overrun either by fundamentalist Islam or Christianity on the one hand, or conspiracy theories and, and um, uh, wokeism on the other. Something like um, uh, you know, some of the more benevolent societies like New Zealand and, and uh, Norway and Switzerland, where they, uh, they seem to be doing just fine you know, by and large, not that they're free of these delusions, but at least as a mass movement, they are neither jihadists nor crusaders nor uh, QAnon uh, nor social justice warriors. Uh, so what's going on in conspiracy theories? I think they're, they're uh, you know, as with many social phenomena, there are different ingredients in the explanation. One of them is, uh, it's in the, there's some ideas that by their very nature, spread in certain ways. And this goes back to the concept of a meme as Richard Dawkins originally defined it, not as a funny picture of a cat with a, with a, a caption, but just as an idea that has been selected to be easily spreadable in an analogous way the genes are selected for their ability to reproduce. And an idea that it is, has built in unfalsifiability, such as the, the lack of evidence for this conspiracy 
proves what an insidious conspiracy it is, comes with this, this built-in advantage. And there are other, there's a family of beliefs, such as if you denounce, if you fail to denounce so-and-so as a racist, that shows that you're a racist. That is a kind of idea with a kind of built-in self-protection that can become entrenched. You know, unless there is the meta-awareness that that's a kind of belief that is uh, so uh, seductive that we ought to be on our guard against it. So that's one part of the explanation. Another part is there is probably something in human psychology that makes us uh, open to conspiracy theories. That being that going back to the history of violence, in the kind of violence that we were vulnerable to in a large part of our evolutionary history, the kind of tribal and, and um, primitive warfare before there were organized uh, armies, the main threat was not in pitched battles, of two sides kind of chucking spears at each other, but in the stealthy pre-dawn raid, in the ambush along a, a hunting trail. And so we were vulnerable to conspiracies and probably there's something, some built-in paranoia suspicion that is easy to, 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 to flare up. And the third is, uh, part of the explanation is, you know, some of these theories seem just so outlandish that you just can't imagine any sane person believing them, like QAnon or, or uh, COVID is in a, a conspiracy to implant microchips. And the question arises, <clears throat> what does it mean when we say people believe them? Do they literally believe them in the sense that they'd be willing to stake their lives on them? Now, in some cases, the answer is yes, the people who turn down vaccines. But for uh, the, the chemtrails and the QAnon, is it kind of like religion in the sense that it's not in the realm of testable reality. It's kind of a faith. It's kind of an uplifting, uh, edifying, empowering um, uh, myth that you believe it's in our collective interest to believe and literal truth or falsity you can't know and, and who really cares. Uh, the fact, and just to give, throw out an example of what I mean concretely by that, uh, the Pizzagate conspiracy theory, a kind of predecessor of QAnon, according to which the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria in Washington, D.C. housed a, a, a pedophile ring affiliated with the Democratic Party. Uh, that, one of the believers in that theory acted by leaving a one-star Google review at the pizzeria saying that the pizza dough was uh, undercooked and there were some men looking suspiciously at my son. Now, if you really believe that children were being raped in the basement, you know, wouldn't you call the police? instead of leaving a one-star review on, on Google, it suggests that the belief in cases like that is different from belief in the physical reality around you. I, I belatedly caught up with uh, Martin Gurry's book, The Revolt of the Public, uh, which I'd somehow missed when it, it first came out and uh, was reading it the other day. And it strikes me that part of what's going on here is that rationality has become associated with the governmental hierarchies, the bureaucracies uh, of the 20th century that Guri talks about, and, uh, and what the internet has allowed to happen is a sort of revolt against uh, those authorities. And, and that's why public health officials get vilified, uh, because there's been a generalized loss of trust in these institutions, in these government agencies. And that sort of translates into a loss of trust in rationality itself. Uh, and, and, that, and that's, of course, uh, the way you open the door to the conspiracy theories. But let me, given that time is uh, beginning to run out on us, let me ask a, a, a few final questions. One, one uh, you already alluded to, uh, him, here's a quote. My greatest surprise in making sense of moral progress is how many times in history the first domino was a reasoned argument. And you give a whole bunch of examples of the first argument against religious intolerance, the first argument against war, Erasmus, the first against capital punishment, against the criminalization of homosexuality, Jeremy Bentham, and so on. And I, I was wondering, as I was reading that part of the book, uh, is this actually a new version of the great man or great woman uh, version of history that, that you've kind of discovered that actually what drives forward the, the advance of rationality is a relatively small number of hugely courageous thinkers. Uh, I, I wouldn't put it that way because in none of these cases did you have a kind of cult of personality around the originator of the idea. Uh, it's not as if, you know, feminism was called Estellism after Mary Astell. Uh, I, I, if, if I was to assimilate it to some 
you know, cliche would be there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. That um, I, I do think that ideas, again, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, defer to your uh, expertise and knowledge. Uh, but in history, I think a case could be made that, that ideas can be causal forces, that it's not just the charisma, the military power, the taking over the reins of power of some individual, but sometimes an idea once spread can go viral as we now say. And again, I, I abs absolutely concede that I have not made a cause and effect case in, in that final, those final few pages of the book. I don't know if it could even be done, but uh, I don't claim to have done it. Just suggestive and I think plausible that certain ideas were kind of loosed on the world and proliferated when in our current terms became viral as they were disseminated in pamphlets and debated in pubs and salons and coffee houses and that that could have played a role in uh, in history so it's neither kind of materialist um, determinism it's not quite great man and woman but it is something like ideas as a as one of the potential causal forces in history I'm very sympathetic to this view of history, actually, and I think one of the great wrong turnings my discipline took was to downplay the role of ideas. I particularly find convincing your point that very few of these big ideas get associated with a personality cult, Bentham maybe being the exception. But what would you like your name to be in that role of honour? In other words, assuming that, that, that there is some importance attached to the individuals who make these arguments. After all, they don't make themselves. You need somebody to write the book. Is that really how you see yourself as somebody who belongs on, on a kind of roll of honor of rationalist thinkers pushing forward the, the cause of, of rational living? Um, it's, uh, you know, I'm probably the last person to, to ask because one of the great findings about rationality from Tversky and Kahneman and others is that all of us are overconfident in uh, the, the, the rightness of our own beliefs. We all are subject to the bias bias, namely we think everyone else is biased but ourselves. And uh, I do, I mean, obviously I wouldn't have written the book if I didn't think that there were good ideas in it, if I didn't, didn't think I had something to add. Uh, but I, I'm also mindful of the danger in academia and intellectual life of the intellectual guru. And I've seen it happen that when someone gets uh, outsized influence, then their kind of quirks, their personalities can steer a field in a certain direction. And that isn't the way uh, intellectual progress happens. Uh, you know, I, it always happened with, with gurus like Marx and Freud and uh, Lacan and Derrida and my former MIT colleague, Noam Chomsky, as brilliant as he was, as he is, uh, the fact that he has such outsized influence has uh, not been good for the field. The fact that, that he is too, rec the ideas are too associated with one guy. I have one last tiny question, which I can't resist asking. Uh, there's one sentence that begins, Kaplan forecasted that in the first decades of the 21st century, and I thought, <laughs> you know, hang on a minute, you're supposed to be an expert in linguistics, forecasted is not good English, it surely is forecast. There is a story behind that. I, uh, in, an, in an earlier phase of my career, I studied regular and irregular verbs. Uh, and uh, I, a little bit uh, mischievously, used forecasted because I advanced a theory according to which the past tense forms of uh, verbs derived from nouns are regularized even if they sound a lot like an irregular. So that's why in baseball you say he flied out to second field, not he flew out. It comes from the noun a fly. In the case of forecast, it depends on how you mentally parse it. If you think it's to make a forecast, it should be forecasted like broadcasted. If you think it's something like to cast in advance, then forecast uh, would be more natural. But I, uh, uh, in a way, I kind of try to uh, manipulate the data favoring my theory by putting that out in, in, in uh, common parlance. Well, f future commentators in this conversation will say that I cast dispersions when you <laughs> use the word forecasted. Uh, we have now reached the point uh, when we turn to uh, the audience for questions. And I think those questions are in the possession of our friend Ted Haptagabar. Ted? Yes, um, thank you very much, Neil. Um, first question comes from a gentleman who says, 
The Economist says you underplay the importance of skepticism. Would you respond to that? Yeah, I think I thought it was bizarre. Skepticism is uh, runs all the way through the book. It's uh, we ought to be skeptical uh, of everything. Skeptical, not in the sense of um, nihilistically or cynically rejecting anything that we don't like, <clears throat> but in the sense of seeking reasons. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so I actually had no idea where that that criticism came from because. Yeah, skepticism is a good thing. It's the basis of, of science, the basis of Bayesian reasoning, uh, and, and much else. As you can imagine, we have a lot of questions tied to rationality vis-a-vis -vis how um, we have uh, uh, navigated ourselves through the pandemic. So I'm going to go through some of those. Uh, first question is, follow the science has been a language used a lot in the last 18 months. Has that helped? Um, and if not, uh, what, how else would you, might you have suggested um, people using that phraseology might say, say it differently? It's a great question, and it <clears throat> relates to um, Neil's invocation of Martin Gurry and the distrust of elites. Uh, <clears throat> just saying, trust me, including trust science, if science is thought to be a priesthood, an establishment, is not rational because scientists are human too. I, I think that scientists and public health officials did fall down in showing their work. That is not, we're scientists, trust us. That, that's not gonna work. But here are the reasons that we think masks are effective based on what we know so far. <clears throat> As data come in, we may change our mind because we start out ignorant about everything. Uh, likewise, here is our reasons that you should take a vaccine with costs and benefits, uh, that scientific communication had a massive, massive set of fails when it came to COVID, precisely because trust the science was, is not the right message. It's look at the reasons, look at the data. We are conduits for that, not we are oracles who ought to be uh, obeyed. Would you comment on communicating rationality in the age of social media? Yeah, I have. Um, <clears throat> I was initially pretty skeptical of the fad of blaming every social ill on social media, and uh, although I am becoming a little more sympathetic to the idea that social media has, has uh, in, in large part, been a force away from uh, rationality, arguments from John Rausch and the Constitution of Knowledge, that many of the rules that we put in place to make us collectively more rational, such as uh, not acting on your first uh, impulse, such as fact checking, such as cultivating a, a deserved reputation for accuracy, are kind of thrown out the window when, uh, when it comes to, to, to uh, social media, uh, and that it therefore amplifies some of our less rational side. Uh, so uh, as opposed to another new digital institution, namely Wikipedia, which uh, is, is been su surprisingly accurate, not perfect. We all know its flaws, but uh, uh, somehow the overarching commitment to neutrality, objectivity, the mechanisms for um, uh, correction have resulted in something that, that's, uh, that, that's pretty good, pretty, pretty rational. So it does call for kind of scrutiny is what are the kinds of conduits of mechanisms that uh, conduce toward a greater rationality and which uh, kind of allow people to indulge in their, their worst instincts. Um, winning in the language of political messaging seems counter to rationality, as long as a desired message, sometimes counter to being rational, is what ends being communicated. Um, would you comment on that and how the media who interprets some of this messaging might help influence otherwise? Yeah, another um, a profound question, because one of the most powerful of the cognitive biases is something that's called the my side bias. Uh, it's a variety of motivated reasoning where you know what conclusion you want to be true and you twist your reasoning to get there. In this case, it's not necessarily individual advantage, but rather the, the glory and the rightness and the reputation and the influence of the, the group that you belong to, your political party, your political ideology, uh, your, your uh, sect. And of course, in the game of politics, the, the goal is, is winning, not, not truth. 
it's the role of the, the press to uh, uh, awaken people to the discrepancies, to the case in which what's power, popular or powerful may not be the best means to an, an end that we all want. And the problem, of course, being that when the media themselves um, uh, accumulate a reputation for partisanship, then you ignore the media that you that are that are not congenial. And so um, this is not something that I know how to do, but it is an aspiration that we should work toward of uh, media institutions that can credibly cultivate a reputation for neutrality, objectivity, evaluating things on their uh, merits to push back against the tendency that we all have to root for our side and to twist our understanding so that it makes our side um, uh, look good. It's another example of the, this game theoretic problem of uh, there's a perverse rationality in each party, each sect trying to make themselves as influential and as powerful as possible. That's not doesn't work to the interests of everyone in society, where what does work toward our interests is our best understanding of reality, our best understanding of which policies get us the things that we want, something that can't be done a priori, but has to be receptive to evidence, to evaluation, uh, to, to data. And our universities, our influential media should be dedicated really to open-minded evaluation of uh, policies, platforms, positions, to the extent that it's humanly possible. In some uh, articles and reviews on the book, I've uh, read the quote uh, from you, rationality has an image problem, rationality is uncool. Um, how can that be changed? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I don't know if it's a matter of, um, getting the influencers in, in, in Hollywood and elsewhere to have more sympathetic, you know, sexier, dashing characters who are, are rational. Uh, or I, 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 none of us knows how to move a culture when it consists of unspoken norms and images. Uh, you know, no one decided that every member of the um, um, Gen X and, and millennials should get tattoos and pierced. They just did it and it kind of circulated. And likewise, no one decided, uh, can decide that we all ought to value rationality. We should, we should try to do it by example, uh, by, by who we admire, who we don't, by our own conduct, but it isn't the kind of thing that can be legislated from the top down. Our final question comes from a parent who says, um, it seems to me uh, that there's got to be a way to invoke uh, the teaching of rationality and or critical thinking um, in schools. Um, are you aware of any curriculum around this? There are critical thinking curricula that um, truth be told have um, so far a mediocre success record. Uh, on the other hand, Everything that we teach has a mediocre success record if we look at how much students retain uh, six months out. So by applying, Dan Willingham is the psychologist who has looked at this and he points out that it is possible to do a better job at teaching critical thinking if we apply some lessons from cognitive psychology, like encouraging students not to get stuck in the example in which something is demonstrated, but encouraging them to leap to dissimilar examples, to have more active learning as opposed to just reading a textbook or listening to a professor. So the general tools of pedagogy ought to be applied above all to critical thinking, which so far they have not so much. Well, Steve, I think we've reached that point at which uh, we have to wrap this. As you were talking there, I was bursting to say, Arthur Conan Doyle came up with two heroes designed to popularize uh, rationality, Sherlock Holmes and the wonderful Professor Challenger, who deserves to be much better known. Challenger also had the great virtue of throwing journalists down the stairs if he disagreed with them. Uh, and then there's Doctor Who. I think British culture has been better than American culture at producing rationalist heroes. And uh, and that's why I encourage uh, my, my kids to, to, to be Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who fans. Uh, your new book, Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters, establishes that you, Steve Pinker, belong in the same, uh, in the same class as Sherlock 
Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who. Uh, in fact, I think you're the nearest thing to Doctor Who that Harvard has. And uh, I'd just like to congratulate you on the book. Uh, wish it every success and, and look forward to seeing you uh, in, in real space as well as uh, on Zoom pretty soon. Hope so. Thank you so much, Neil. Great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Thanks for both returning to Live Talks Los Angeles and special thanks to those who sent in questions. Again, Stephen Pinker's book is Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters, and it is available wherever books are sold. Copies with signed book plates can be purchased in the link in the comments section. Neil Ferguson's latest book is Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, and copies of his also with signed book plates can be purchased in the comments section also. Thank you and go on gently.